uh, it is an honor and a privilege for me to do this. Pratyekangi uh, Puskam Court Judgment Nida Balgopal Rasna Vyasalo, Nalpe Vyasalo Nai. Avyasalo Muppe and Vidyasala and Nyayaga the Vritilo Pravishin Chin Tarvada Rasna Vi, Rendu Vyasalo, Patha Vyasal. Every one of the uh, articles. Uh, in the book, barring the two that were written in 1990 and 92, there are 40 in all. Uh, 38 of them were written between 98 and 2009, till about a month or two before he passed away. And he entered the profession around then in the late 90s. So most of them are his reflections from within the legal profession, not necessarily in the cases that he uh, appeared in or argued in, but as an in-court observer of the transactions that are common, uh, commonly uh, seen and understood within courts. I will speak for the most part in English. The book itself is in Telugu. Uh, and he speaks about judgments in a very easy and um, uh, in a very easy and simple uh, language. Uh, I will try to introduce uh, this book uh, to uh, uh, non Telugu literate people. I have, uh, and I will in the course of doing that also try and look at what uh, are the main points of what he says uh, in this book. There are several strands of course in what he is saying. In a span of 10 years, he is looking at, uh, which is the bulk of the essays, 10, 11 years. He is looking at the history of courts from the earlier period to the period when he is writing and the possible futures of constitutional jurisprudence. The focus is on jurisprudence itself under liberalism, under neoliberalism, uh, looking at uh, traditional jurisprudence, uh, looking at human rights jurisprudence, Mukhyanga Rajanga Spurti and Tainti. This is his primary concern through all of them. And our Rajanga Spurti, Tirpulala Manak Kanpartunda, Yemerek Kanpartundi, Indu Kanparat Ledu. What is wrong with the interpretation? Where is the interpretation falling short? that we are actually not able to grasp the constitutional spirit in judgments delivered by courts of every jurisdiction. To a lesser extent, he speaks about trial courts, to a larger extent about the High Court and the Supreme Court. And broadly, the streams of jurisprudence that he uh, looks at, like I said, are within the liberal, within the neoliberal, in the neoliberal he is particularly referring to various, in various essays, I think four or five essays uh, to the Narbada Bachao Andolan, including the contempt uh, case against you and Medha Patkar, uh, but also looking at the court's complicity in furthering a neoliberal agenda of development by the state, where the court actually ventriloquizes the state's perspective on development rather than providing a shelter for citizens and people against a predatory state. So where do we then locate the state and the court in relation to each other, particularly if the separation of powers is the hallmark of democracy? So this is again one of the major questions he raises. Is it the task of the judiciary to arrogate to itself the role of protector of the state? Is it the duty of the judiciary to speak on behalf of the state 
or under the fundamental rights chapter is it the duty of the judiciary to speak on behalf of the people in defense of the people against the state and he traces this with reference to a number of different uh, uh, cases. Uh, the one aspect of it that does not come through but comes through to us in the present time and to which we can extend his analysis is uh, the question of what I would call Hindutva jurisprudence which is now the major and predominant trend that seems to even, even threaten to dismantle the constitution at various levels and interlocks with neoliberal and, uh, uh, and conservative jurisprudence as well. In terms of the issues that he speaks about, there are a range of different issues. So he speaks about the kidnap of film star Rajkumar, but in speaking about the kidnap of film star Rajkumar, he actually poses a parallel because along with Rajkumar were 51 villagers who were charged under TADA and who were facing trial. So whose life is it that we need to protect? Is it Rajkumar's life or is it the life of these villagers? What is the argument that uh, we need to proffer in order to protect life and liberty of those right at the bottom of uh, the social hierarchy uh, who are targets of crimes of dominance? And how do we protect those lives? So if the argument is that you cannot bend to abduction. Kidnap chase the kidnap chase na wala demands ni immediate ga mana mangi karin chaddu ani anukunte. Is that a uniform rule that we can apply to everybody? For instance, and the very interesting parallel he draws is for instance, if on the one side you have Rajkumar who is kidnapped, and on the other side you have a busload of school children who are kidnapped with the same set of demands made of the state, would your action in both the cases be the same? So would you develop a uniform rule or must you calibrate your solutions to the case in question? And he urges the reader to actually take a nuanced view of understanding state action and of understanding the writ of constitutional jurisprudence. The second major uh, question he looks at is the question of environment. Again, at two ends, the fight around the Rajiv Gandhi National Park in Bombay, where villagers in the surrounding areas faced eviction because it was a threat to the conservation and beautification of the park. And the question of environment raised by the Narmada Bachao Andolan and the demands made by the protesters in the NBA or that centered on questions of livelihood but also centered on questions of environment and the damage of big dams. So at no point in no single question is he actually looking at one side of the story alone but trying to pose the complexities in evolving a human rights jurisprudence. Manavha Kula Nyaya Siddhanta Manti Eviti. Is it something that we just can have an iron rule about? Or is it something that is live, like we say the living constitution? Is it something that is live and continuously um, evolving? In terms of constitutional interpretation, again, the whole question of Rajanga Spurti, what is, what is this Rajanga Spurti, what is con the constitutional spirit? How do you actually sidestep the need to do a strict interpretation, a strict and narrow interpretation of the constitution into looking at the constitution as a more expansive, broad, um, um, universal but location specific uh, umbrella for the protection of fundamental rights. How do you understand, how should courts understand fundamental rights 
in relation to the directive principles and in relation to the preamble. So today we are talking about the preamble and the directive principles. In 2010, I think Justice Sudarshan Reddy, who has written one of the four words, Oka Mundumata Justice Sudarshan Reddy Garra But in 2010, when uh, Justice Sudarshan Reddy gave his uh, decision on the Reliance case, uh, he in fact looked at great length at the fiduciary responsibility of the state and the power of the directive principles in governance. Balgopal is in fact reiterating that viewpoint of uh, looking at the constitution as a whole, of looking at the constitution in terms of what Justice Sudarshan Reddy called the triadic ethical foundation of the constitution, that is the preamble, the fundamental rights and the directive principles of state policy. And throughout the book, this is one of the, one of the repeated pleas he makes with reference to very many different cases uh, that he is looking at. Uh, also the role of international conventions, whether in relation to human rights cases and TADA and custodial violence, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the framework of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, to what extent would we make that applicable? To what extent would we make other international conventions applicable? And he discusses particularly the Vishakha judgment in the context of the suicide by a lawyer, Sangeeta Sharma in 2000. Um, and, and how would we actually integrate the, uh, uh, the text of international conventions into the cases that we see in the here and now? The connections between movements, um, courts and the state is another uh, area that animates his work. To what extent can movements, uh, courts and state collaborate and on which issues? Even Shinlo, he looks particularly at the LTR cases, the land transfer regulation cases in West Godavari district, where Justice B.S.A. Swami gives a positive uh, judgment which is then carried forward. But then of course he also talks about the way in which that judgment was rolled back by Justice Subhashan Reddy, who then later in his book comes up for some really serious criticism on charges of corruption where the lawyers of the Madras High Court actually moved to have him impeached on charges of corruption. So he's also talking about lawyers' conduct. He's talking about judicial conduct. He is talking about the, uh, the question of the moral, uh, the, you know, the, the moral value or the moral rectitude with which legal institutions need to function. In, co in the context of moral value and moral rectitude, one of the cases he speaks about, and this was possibly his second last essay, which was in 2009, July or August, on the Nas Foundation case, uh, which decriminalized consensual homosexuality. And there he is actually discussing the case, but oddly enough, he doesn't pick up the central tenet that emerges from that case which is the idea, Ambedkar's idea of constitutional morality that was central to the reasoning in Nas Foundation. Uh, but in the essay on Nas Foundation, Balgopal doesn't pick that up, but he does talk about the moral value of, or, or the, mo the moral standing uh, of constitutional jurisprudence in other contexts. And I think that in that sense, what this also helps us to do is to look at the different cases in relation to each other. Because throughout he is talking about constitutional morality, Rajyanga Naitikata, this is his preoccupation. And how do we understand Rajyanga Naitikata not only with reference to the Nas Foundation case, not only with reference to homosexuality, because even Nas Foundation did not limit it to homosexuality but in re relation to uh, a whole range of different issues. 
how might we characterize crime particularly in the context of um, uh, the code of conduct for aspiring candidates put out by election commissions or the requirements for uh, 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 a legitimate or um, acceptable candidacy. And one of the arguments was that people aspiring for elected office should not be accused of crime. And the question he asks is how neromanti ain't how do we understand crime? Because left parties particularly, and this goes back a long time, Nikhileshwar Garu is here, this goes back a long time. Left parties particularly opposed the uh, wanted political crime to be excluded from the list of crimes that might disqualify candidates and said it should be limited to uh, grave crimes. But what are grave crimes? Uh, how would you define it? Would you define it in terms of punishment? Would you define it in terms of its gruesome nature? And there is one of the important observations he makes, which is that sure, exclude political crime, because if you do not exclude political crime, nobody from Kashmir, for instance, will ever be able to stand for political office because they are all accused, whether uh, justifiedly or not, of political crime. Uh, so exclude political crime. In ordinary crime, do not make gravity of sentence the reason for deciding whether a crime is grave. Instead include what he calls morally unacceptable crime. This is basically what we might call Adipatya Nera, you know, crimes of dominance. So if it is atrocities under the Prevention of Atrocities Act, if it is collective violence that is part of a communal uh, uh, massacre, uh, if it is crimes against women, if it is crimes against oppressed groups for the per perpetrated for the reason of that oppression, th then you might include that in, you know, from deciding on whether a candidate is valid or not. The uh, next issue, and I have just a couple of issues which I will uh, uh, recount very briefly. The next is the question of trade unionism. And I won't go into this in great detail, but he speaks of trade unionism in relation to government employees, in relation to labor unions, in relation to uh, doctors, junior doctors, uh, in relation to a whole range of people and links that up with the right to protest. Do we have the right to protest on public roads? And there are decisions that say we have the right to protest. So how do we uphold the right to protest? And just because we say that employees should have the right to protest as much as labor, uh, uh, as much as workers do, let us not assume that there is an inherent solidarity between them. We need to build. And I think that this is a really important point that he raises, that we, we have to work towards building a solidarity between different classes on the right to protest or the right to strike. So uh, merely because we support employees who uh, want the right to strike, let us not assume that tomorrow if unorganized workers or mine workers or any other class of workers comes out on strike, that government employees will automatically support them. They may not. And the task of the human rights movement is to actually create that kind of uh, solidarity. Uh, in, in terms of the, the last one, uh, the, the, the last uh, uh, instance that I will talk about is uh, the question of the freedom of expression in the matter of dress. 
or in the matter of saying a prayer. He takes the instance of uh, school children in Kerala who refused to sing the national anthem during general assembly because they wanted to recite their religious prayer and their religion did not allow them to bend to anybody except Christ. So Justice Chinnapredi then gives a very important judgment that says just because they refuse to recite the national anthem in school does not mean that they are unpatriotic. Now this bears very important lessons and also other students who uh, wanted to grow a beard but were forced by the institutions to cut their beard and come clean shaven. This propels him to look at the way in which the freedom of expression must be understood. And I th think that this really bears very important lessons to us, uh, for us. And finally, while we are on the subject of rowdies, our Prime Minister, Honorable Prime Minister have, has spoken eloquently about rowdies. And uh, then one of the first rowdies we hear of is uh, benefits for retiring judges of the Supreme Court. And uh, one of the essays uh, on judges, the second section two has just five essays, all the remaining are in section one. Uh, he is actually speaking about the state government upgrading the cars of high court judges and saying, is a car worth eight lakhs important or um, uh, necessary for judges to read and deliver, deliberate on the constitution justly. What is the relationship between extravagant expense and uh, their work in judicial office? And there has to be some sense of accountability that judges have to the system. Uh, the only essay that stands alone in the, whole in the whole volume is the first essay, which was possibly his earliest, 1992, uh, for the centenary of Kanyasulkam, where he has a very nice essay on uh, the figure of the law in Kanyasulkam. And I think that uh, I was actually wishing there was more he had written on literature and law, because it's not adequately deliberated on uh, in India. And yet we have some stunning examples uh, in India. Kanyasulkam is at one end, but we had uh, K.G. Satyamurti reciting Kutradaru Vangmulam in the court in the pa Parvatipuram conspiracy case. We had Nikhilesh Varugaru and the Digambara Kavulu actually reciting their poetry. Bhayam and other poems are actually poems that find mention in court judgments. So we have a rich history of the engagement of law with literature in very, very uh, many different uh, ways in, in the Telugu states and it would be a good idea to uh, go through them. And so uh, finally, I think what I really miss uh, in the volume uh, is an annotation of the judgments contained here. Because Balgopal was writing on the run. You know, so as, as a case became current, he was writing on it. And they're all opeds. And in opeds, uh, you don't really provide res references and citations. But I think for uh, law students, for students of the social sciences, for lawyers entering the profession or wanting to expand their horizons within the profession, providing citations and references for the cases that he was talking about would be extremely useful. Thank you very much.